and welcome to my talk. My name is Jiaqi Liu. I am a Chicago-based software engineer currently working at the Center for Translational Data Science at the University of Chicago. Today, I will be speaking about observability and monitoring when designing and building data pipelines. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Uh, for today's agenda, we'll talk about data pipelines in general, uh, common issues with data pipelines, and some features to design for when building data pipelines. Um, and we'll close out by talking about testing, monitoring, and alerting. Uh, so what are data pipelines? Uh, at a very high level, data pipelines uh, start with putting data in and outputting data out somewhere. But in production systems, they tend to be very large and complex, um, and it's never quite so simple to build one. Uh, you've probably heard of data pipelines referred to as a ETL process. Um, the core principle sounds very, very simple. You have some extraction phase where data is getting fetched from a source. Um, this could be a real-time feed. Um, it could also be a very large file if it's bulk data. And then there's some transformation to make the data workable, uh, or there's some analysis on the data. Um, either way, there's some munging of the data to make it accessible to users. And then in the last step, the data is often loaded into some data warehouse with the user interface, uh, or just back in storage so that it can be accessed and analyzed and transformed further at some later point. So this is kind of the standard framework with data pipelines. So we'll talk about both uh, batch and stream processes in this discussion. So in batch processes, uh, there's periodic processes that read from, from bulk data. Um, so it's very chunky. There's a sort of starting point and stopping point. And then with streaming processes, it's high throughput, low latency, and it's a very continuous stream of data or queue of data. Uh, they tend to have different SLAs and different requirements and require different monitoring strategies, which we'll talk about a little bit on. Uh, so you can't really talk about data pipelines without talking about orchestrators. Um, so there's a lot of really helpful tools for orchestrating your data. And depending on the tool, you might have some built-in monitoring and built-in observability as well. The topics discussed here are tool agnostic. And each of these tools have their own way of incorporating some of the features I discuss. Uh, but that is unfortunately outside of the scope of this talk. And orchestration can fill in a lot of um, the common issues when working with data pipelines, such as monitoring and uh, scheduling. And these are some common tools. Uh, Luigi and Airflow are uh, open source tools. And uh, AWS Data Pipeline and Google Dataflow are, are cloud-based tools. So let's talk about what could go wrong with data pipelines. Uh, so there's a lot of things that could go wrong with any kind of uh, system. But the most obvious ones are um, very easy to verify. So batch jobs are, are never scheduled, and therefore they never run. Uh, a batch job takes longer than expected to run, which could be a sign of an issue, or maybe you have more data than you anticipated. Um, at some point in the process, data can get malformed or corrupted. At some point in the process, you could accidentally lose data. Uh, in a stream process, your stream could get backed up, and this could happen for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be because there's malformed data that's causing errors in the system, um, or you could also have uh, stream data that gets lost. Uh, and last but not least, um, non-deterministic systems, such as machine learning models, can be very challenging to work with because they're not always very predictable in behavior. Uh, so this is sort of an example of, um, you know, monitoring or visualizing the, the run of a batch job. It's very spiky. Um, so you'll see when a batch job has run, spikes when data has been processed. You can sort of see inconsistencies in batch size where maybe some batches are taking longer than others to run. Um, but you want to, in general, be monitoring for, you know, how long these batch jobs take to run, what the size of each batch is, uh, you know, how much memory you're using and things like that. Uh, for stream jobs, you want to be measuring latency. You also want to be looking into the egress and ingress of the queue of the stream. Uh, and you also want to be monitoring for the age of the oldest data point that has yet to be processed, because that is tend to signal, oh, there might be some data in there 
that has been through the stream that has stayed in the stream for longer than it should have. Uh, general concerns with data pipelines, so delayed processing, so both in batch and stream jobs, if it's slower than expected, that is a concern. So it's important to know what your expected SLAs are. And then there's a data integrity issue, which is if data is exposed or lost, if you have run your data through the pipeline, and at the end of it, you don't actually have the results that are useful to you, uh, or you have misleading results, that's a big problem. Um, so, in, you know, to sum it all, you do sort of need to know uh, not just about the, the process, the system, uh, latency, but you also kind of need to know about the data itself to really measure the health of your data pipeline. And this brings us to two really important concepts, uh, interpretability and observability. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, interpretability is a concept from data science, and uh, it refers to the notion that you kind of need to know why a model has predicted the way that it is. And it's important for a variety of reasons, uh, like privacy, for instance, or, or fairness, and um, the reliability of a model. Um, but it also means that when you are for an interpretable model, you allow for debugging and auditing of, of these uh, models and understand why the result is the way it is. If you have introduced bias into your machine learning model, that is something you can audit and correct for. Um, so again, interpretability emphasizes these concepts, fairness, privacy, usually of the user um, whose data you're running the model on, reliability of the system, robustness, uh, so things like if you make a small change to input, it doesn't lead to drastically big changes in the production of the model, and uh, trust and causality. So causality checks that um, a predicted change in the decision isn't due to arbitrary changes in the input values. And trust, um, it's easier for humans to trust the system that can sort of explain the decision behind it instead of a, a black box model. Observability is a, a concept from uh, reliability engineering, and it refers to the notion that you, you, know, you can't catch for things you don't know about, so you need to build a system that allows you to debug once you encounter um, you know, issues or incidents uh, in the, uh, the first time you encounter incidents or uh, incidents or issues. So this is a um, lovely diagram from a blog post by Cindy Sardharan and refers to the, the notion that, you know, you can't catch for all the edge cases in testing. You can't monitor for, for failure points that you haven't seen before, but we can build a system that is easy to debug and arm engineers with evidence instead of conjecture when something goes wrong. Um, so it's a set of monitoring tools for, for possible failures. Uh, and to me, I, I see it as the, you know, SRE equivalent of interpretability. Let's talk a little bit about um, the pipeline features that allow for interpretability and observability. So uh, from my perspective, there's three key features. Immutable data, having a data lineage, having a test run feature, um, and some way to do the, the test run mode where you can have a, you know, dry run before you go into production. So let's talk about immutable data. Um, so immutable data is core to designing a system that is easy to test, idempotent, and reproducible. Uh, so idempotent re operations refer to operations such that the same input will consistently produce the same output, meaning it's a function with no side effects. And immutable data allows you to basically, if you need to run a process um, that has already happened, you need to recreate it somehow, you are able to do so. And immutable data leads to reproducible outcomes, which makes it easier to test, but also backtrack and investigate anything that might have gone wrong. 
uh, in this paragraph, uh, data is stored as an immutable sequence of events that collectively tells the whole story. Uh, so take, for instance, a bank account. At the end, you probably want to display a user's current balance, but you, know, you can store the current balance as is and override it every time it changes, but that limits the data usage um, to just displaying the current balance. So storing the data as immutable transactions or credits and debits allow you to leverage the data for various use cases and view the history of the account. And it also allows you to understand maybe at a historic point in time what the user's balance was. So this allows for reproducible testing and can become really valuable. Uh, data lineage. Um, so as mentioned, data pipelines sort of go through multiple sequence of events. Immutable data enables you to create data lineage if at those different parts of the pipeline you have different outputs. Um, so you can then go back to specifically the output of a step in the pipeline and determine this is a step where something went wrong or this is a step where data mutated in a way that I did not expect. Uh, so data lineage is really beneficial to diagnostics. You want to know not just what code is causing a specific output, but what data input was given that led to that series of behavior. Uh, so this is my rough sketch of um, a data pipeline with maybe some level of um, lineage. And uh, I see data lineage as something that is kind of like version control of data. You have to know where your data has come from, what triggered the transformation, and if you have to revert that specific transformation of your data, how do you do that? Um, so how do you actually build data lineage? A couple of things that you can do. You can tag records with metadata. So you, for every step of the pipeline, you can tag your output with the version of the code that created that output and the source of the data that created that output. And that will allow you to gradually trace back the whole pipeline to what code was run, what data was inputted. Um, you can use a distributed tracer and use unique identifiers to track at every step uh, how the data mutated and you know which um, identifier points to the next subsequent identifier, et cetera. Uh, there are other ways to do this. Um, you can do this via logging as well. Uh, it is important to just have some level of data lineage. It doesn't need to be fully robust in the beginning. Maybe just having a data source at the as the um, as some sort of metadata tied to your output. <laughs> so the test run feature. So there's a strong reason to you know advocate for rejecting or um, any unexpected data out front, but that's not always possible. You can't again you know with the observability model you can accommodate for all known edge cases. Uh, so this is where having a test front might be helpful because you might want to be able to run the data against the code or the logic and see what the output will look like and be able to do a couple of sanity checks before deploying the data pipeline into production. Um, so this allows you to have a gradual and opt optional validation, which allows you to build up the domain expertise you need um, to enforce data quality on your uh, system. Um, so the test run allows you to validate sort of the assumptions you might have about the data itself um, without compromising a production system. So to, to that then, you know, within data science, you definitely make a lot of assumptions about the data, whether it's about where the data comes from, what it means, but also in terms of the, um, the criteria of the data. So do you have a string value? Do you always have a numerical value? What data type is within this field? Do you always have this column? Do you sometimes have this other extra field, et cetera? Um, and it's really important that you are able to, you know, be able to define a schema for the data that you are working with and document changes that evolution to that schema. Um, you know, schema should be able to be pretty dynamic and um, you can use that to safeguard against malformed data once you validate your assumptions. Uh, so, you know, the 
to close that out, testing the pipeline is really important because then you have the ability to uh, validate the data transformation at least a little bit before committing your data to um, a production database. So on um, testing, monitoring, and alerting, uh, so I have uh, the test pyramid. This is uh, a pretty well-known test pyramid. Um, and it sort of outlines that the, the very base, you want to have uh, unit tests, the test for granular logic uh, for each function of the code. You have service level tests, and then you have some, some UI tests um, for your user experience. Uh, I would argue that for, for data science and data pipeline, there are a couple of extra testing criteria. One is the regression test, um, being able to identify that you have not regressed since your previous uh, release. And within data science modeling, um, this can sometimes be known as the champion challenger uh, model. So you might have two models running simultaneously in production. And over time, you're measuring the precision and recall of, of uh, both models. And whoever performs better ends up being deployed into production. So you could have model A, which has been running in production for a while, and maybe you develop model B. Um, but you should be able to measure precision and recall for both of them against the same data set before understanding which one is actually the better model. Uh, so I want to be able to compare, I guess, testing and monitoring um, ideas between RESTful APIs and data pipelining. So within REST APIs, it's pretty normal to have a health check endpoint. Um, and you can periodically pin your health check endpoint to verify that you're getting a 200 status code. Uh, for data pipelines, there's something similar for batch jobs. You can check that a job has succeeded and that a job that is expected to succeed is continuing to succeed. Um, for web services, if you have um, you know, a post endpoint, uh, for a CRUD API, you can have an integration test that posts the one endpoint, and then you should be able to actually see the correct data from a get endpoint. Kind of very similar with data pipelines, you should be able to, you know, input a data pipeline with some fake data and have uh, the output of the data pipeline be some expected result. Latency is another concept. Um, so with web services, that's sort of the average response time of an API, and web services with REST frameworks should really be real time. And with data pipelines, um, if you have a batch system, you know, you're, you should know what the expected time it takes for the data pipeline to complete is so that you can appropriately measure it and monitor for it. Uh, some monitoring tools that I want to talk about. Uh, Prometheus is a time series metrics database. Grafana is then used for visualizing um, time series data. Being able to visualize your um, being able to visualize anything is incredibly powerful. So having a dashboard that allows you to see metrics is really powerful. Uh, and with time series metrics, you can um, set up alerts for them. So you can set the time series metrics uh, for batch jobs. You can gather a metric for how long it took a job to be successful. Uh, and then you can alert on um, if it took longer than expected. Uh, so for alerting, just set a threshold that works for you, establish a baseline and go from there. Um, and you can then come up with more clever uh, algorithms for alerting. Um, can't talk about alerting without talking about paging. You can page on symptoms and not root causes, create a trail of causes of diagnostics, uh, data lineage, immutable test run, ease of development when working with evolving data. Monitoring and alerting allows for overall pipeline to be more observable. And that is it. I will take questions. <laughs>